What's up, everybody? This is Jason Ostrowski, and welcome to another edition of the Everything Real Estate Podcast. I hope all of you are off to a good start in 2021. It seems like we're picking up right where we left off in 2020 as far as the market goes. And I thought about how can we build your business this month? How can we make 2021 your best year that you've ever had in our industry? And who should I talk to to help you get to that next level? Well, I'm really excited and I was very fortunate to be able to sit down with Lee Brown this week. Now, Lee is an international sales and motivational speaker. Um, she is a best selling author. She's written multiple books. She is the top selling agent in the Charlotte, North Carolina area. She now owns her own brokerage as well. She uh, has two podcasts of her own. She's a runner, a singer, a pianist. I mean, I don't know how she does it all, but she is a true rock star and an icon of the real estate industry. So let's break it down with Lee Brown and let her tell you how to make your business better in 2021. And we'll talk on the other side. Lee, how are you doing today? I'm fantastic, Jason. And I'm so honored to be here on your show so that I can bring any value I can bring. So I'm truly, truly honored to have you. And uh, you spoke uh, a few weeks ago. I was at um, a Tri-County Suburban Realtors board meeting. You spoke to us and... um, you know, just what you talked about kind of stuck with me. And I was like, I really, really need to ask Lee to be on my podcast. So right off the bat, I just wanted to ask you now, amongst your list of many achievements in your life, you've been a top selling agent, if not the top selling agent in a huge market in Charlotte, North Carolina. And I've listened to some of your podcasts, I've, I've listened to you speak, and I know the work that it takes to do that. So number one, I mean, what do you attribute to your success? Number one, in real estate being at the top of your game? And then what sacrifices do you have to make in your life to, to be a top agent um, in a major market like Charlotte? Okay, so I can I can talk about this for days, but I'll try to keep it concise, which is not my strength, as you know. 20 words, is, Lee. No. <laughs> I don't sleep well. So just full disclosure, I think you find that a lot of highly productive people that are workaholics, we just don't sleep because our brains don't slow down. But that's okay because that's how God made me, right? So that's one angle of it. But to be a top agent, I'll tell you, it's you do the hard things first, which is kind of how I live every day. So every day I make my first phone call at 8 a.m. And I do that now as a 21-year realtor. I still make daily phone calls. And I'm always amazed by the number of agents. They're like, no, 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 no. That's not the real secret. I'm like, no, that's actually the secret. And no, no, no. What's the... The software or the coach or the magic word, it's not the magic words, it's the work every day. It's what our parents knew and our grandparents knew. And for some reason, our medium aged and younger people seem to have forgotten that. Mm -hmm. So that's what got me to number one is doing those things every day. And the other thing, I was going to find it on my desk because I'm sitting here in my office, which is (laughs) clean behind me, but a mess right here in the front. So it's like a mullet in my office, party in the back (laughs) front, business in the back. It looks looks very fun. I will say that. You know, I got got pops of color, but I have the pillow is covered by a flower pillow. So you can't read the cuss words because I'm (laughs) delicate and stuff. But this was the other way I got to number one was just being really organized. And that's not a typical realtor skill. But this is my buyer intake sheet. Somebody wants to buy a house. I ask them buyer questions. And if somebody wants to sell a house, this is my seller sheet. They ask seller questions and they're color coded so I can find it on my desk because our people don't tend to be organized. And so that's probably the main things, the two things that jacked my business. And I was number one in Charlotte during the Oh, I'm probably 10 years ago at the middle of the Great Recession because I with systems was crushing it. But then you hit a point in your life where you're like, all right, so I'm making all the money and it's great to be number one, but now I'm bored and I want to go do some other big things. So, you know, I'm still very highly productive. I still have a wonderful business, but I've stopped chasing that particular ring. And that's, that's just a life movement thing. But I can't tell you that enough, whether it's leadership or whether it's being a parent or it's working in real estate, you do the hard things first. And as parents, you want to talk about what I would go back and change I would go back and and be more of a really strict boundary person on my schedule. My kids are now 14 and 16, and I feel like I did better than most people for really being protective of my time with them, which is why 
I have a love-hate relationship with technology, but the thing I love about these iPhones is that you can put airplane mode on. Mm. And I taught my kids from day one when I'm the school bus, because I love being the school bus, my phone's in airplane mode. And when I'm the school bus in the afternoon, my phone's in airplane mode because they tell you everything from the back seat. And I never wanted to lose those really connective moments because our business takes that away from us. And as realtors, we have this terrible tendency to focus all of our energy on our clients and on our future clients and on our business, which is why our profession has a really high divorce rate. And it's why so many people have kids that are like, oh, hell no, I'd never go into real estate, even though I'm the kid of a realtor. You kind of wind up in it anyway. Oh, my. So am I. But we can do better, right? And the thing that I learned all along the way is that every time I put put really big guardrails on my schedule, my schedule, my business took off. And then when I was a 24 seven realtor at the beginning, I worked with everybody, anybody, and I was exhausted, started guarding my Sundays, started guarding date nights, started guarding time with my kids. The more I did that, the more people said, oh, you're busy, I'll wait. Because mm-hmm. there's a connectivity between your availability, which equates demand, and with what people are willing to understand as your value. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, to, to boil that down into a concise statement, it's, I mean, it, no, I did not mean that in a disparaging I'm way. Hire, if you can do that, you're hired. <laughs> Would you say consistency and organization is, is hugely important to you? I, I also, I think I read in one of your books that uh, you would reserve time on the weekends for maybe relocation clients or clients from out of town to show places to, and then your your clients that were within the area during the week. Is that is that accurate to say? Yes. And so my voicemail even says, I'm available for your real estate needs from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Weekends are by appointment only. And the reason I do that is frankly, nobody needs to list a house on the weekends. We all know that in a low inventory environment, your best bet is to get it on the market on Thursday so that the sellers can be as inconvenienced as little as possible. But if you're meeting a seller on Saturday, that's frankly when buyers are out looking. So as an agent who's typically trying to balance both sides of their business, it's hard to be all things to all people. So that was an easy carve out because I like listings better anyway. So I was able to get my Saturdays back in large part. And when somebody's relocating, they would come in on a Friday interview with the bank because we're a big banking area. Mm-hmm. Spend Friday evening doing a little supper. Let's have a little education about the area. And then Saturday, we hunker down and find the house. Sundays, I've been carving out for the last 17 years for worship and family because I learned really early that if you let other people have your most important priorities, everything disintegrates. And Mm -hmm. frankly, I mean, I do more business with people at church if I go. That's not why I go, but it's just a nice little side benefit. If you don't show up, it's kind of hard for them to know who you are. Yeah, I think, you know, as as a younger age and now I, you know, I've been in the business, I think almost 15 years. I know you're 20 plus in the business now. And we're the same age, really. Yeah, exactly. I I don't see, you know, we could have been brother and sister, you know. So uh, so I I I just think as an agent early on, I fell into that trap just like many agents do. I would go anywhere, I would do anything. I prided myself on it. And then I would work 24/7 and eventually you get burnt out and you yes. just say, "Hey, I need that day off, you know, whatever day that may be for you, you know, Sundays and and obviously going to church and being with family was very important. Um, I like to do, I always tried to take like a Wednesday off, you know, and, um, and just kind of shut things down midweek and then just keep going, you know, um, you're better with your clients that way, right? Absolutely. Without a it, doubt. Yeah. Real estate is so emotional. And as realtors, we absorb that emotion. So we're trying to keep our sellers calm, keep our buyers calm. They call us and unload and tell us all the unnecessary details, cry on our shoulders, cuss us out. And then we absorb all of that because realtors in general are compassionate, loving people who are also passive aggressive and non-confrontational. So we absorb all of it, which means at the end of the day, you're like a wet spaghetti noodle. And then Mm -hmm. an offer comes in a listing. You're like, I got an offer on your listing. I mean, y'all want it or not. And you're not even doing your best version of yourself because you're destroyed from giving all the time. So I love that concept of instead of a Saturday, Sunday, 
a Wednesday Sunday to make yourself break more frequently so that you can stay energetic and stay your best. Absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. So um, one thing that that I on one of your podcasts, you had mentioned that I was listening to that uh, the best description, I think, of an agent in the field, which is a professional problem solver. And I, it's funny that you say that because a good friend of mine who's also in real estate, I asked him a long time ago, um, you know, I like to ask this question, what do you think is is the most important characteristic he has a team? And I said, when you hire a team member, what are you looking for? What's the most important characteristic? And, and he said, hands down, a problem solver. And so since we are professional problem solvers and it's such a highly tuned skill, I feel like we give that that skill away more often than not when we go on a listing appointment there are so many agents that are so quick to to sell their value right so you being the top notch agent that you are when you go on a listing appointment how do you express value to people that you are that professional problem solver that you are worth that money well it starts with what you ask before you get to the house so of course everywhere around the country right now is experiencing these crazy low levels of inventory where there's nothing in the market it's a feeding frenzy in most areas when something hits but simultaneously you have houses in the multiple listing service that are over there collecting cobwebs because the price and the condition are out of whack because that's everything boils down to that combination of price and condition so when I'm Getting an incoming call and it's that come list me call, a lot of agents will be like, what's the address? 123 Main Street. I'm on my way. I can be there in five minutes or four minutes if I catch the lights right. I'm on my way. Please don't put it on Facebook. Please don't visit. Please don't call me back. Because <gasps> they're, they're so panicked mm-hmm. about not having a sign in the yard. I need the business. I need this. I've got to get over there. So their personal fear stops their ability to be the best professional realtor possible. And if you think about it in terms of the ER, which I love to think about realtors when we get called to list a house, often that family is an emotional crunch related to the house and they need us to come in and figure out that solution. And if you went to the ER and your arm was gushing blood, you don't want the person at the desk to just slap a Band-Aid on it and say, here you go, that's what we do. But unfortunately, most realtors go to a listing appointment. Here's my three comps. Here we go. Here's your price. Here's what you're going to do. The person in the ER should say, okay, hang on a second. Let me get you the galls. What happened? Because if you fell across a barbed wire fence and gashed open, that's a different treatment than if your ex-wife shot you. Because two different scenarios, two different treatment paths, two different possible outcomes. And as realtors, almost every seller has a different desired outcome. And we have to ask better questions. So the number one question I ask before I go to the house, after I get the little particulars, the address, you know, who's got to be involved in the decision. So tell me the three things you're looking for in the realtor you hire. Mm-hmm. And the response is usually, uh, I, um, nobody's asked me that because they don't even know how to answer it. I'm like, it's okay, I'll wait. And then they're going to tell you what matters. The number one response I get is marketing. Okay, great. What does marketing mean to you? Because if I'm talking to a millennial seller, they're going to want video, online ads, social media. If I'm talking to a greatest generation, they probably want me to put an ad in the newspaper, baby boomers and Gen X somewhere in the middle. That allows me to tailor my presentation when I get there. The second most popular thing I'm asked is I want communication. Great. What does communication mean to you? Because I run across sellers that say, well, I want to talk to you every day at 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, ain't happening. I go to bed at nine o'clock. So if I have to get up and talk to you after I've been asleep for two hours, I'm kind of useless. Mm -hmm. But if that's what you need, I can connect you to the right realtor. We have to learn how to meet the consumer where they expect to be met. And realtors love email. Mm -hmm. Most of the public does not. Realtors love text. Part of the public does, but part of the public uses text as a defensive mechanism to keep from having difficult conversations. Mm -hmm. So as realtors, when you start to figure out where they are, you can figure out where to meet them. I'll tell tell you this one I have under contract was classic. What are the three things you want? It's an elderly couple. She said, I need somebody that can get the house sold. All right. Yes, ma'am. I need somebody that can tell me what to do to get it sold because I know it needs some stuff. Yes, ma'am. And I need somebody that can convince my husband to spend the money to get the repairs done. I said, tell me about that. 
She said, well, he has Alzheimer's, but he's still in charge of the bank accounts. And I'm like, oh, Jesus, Mary and Joseph, what am I walking into here? Because now i got to talk about power of attorney. i got to talk about soundness of mind. And my whole presentation had nothing to do with comps and everything to do with what she needed to figure out how to make the house go away because the house needs to go away. And that's what we as realtors have to understand. If you walk in the door figuring out in advance where the public is, frankly, they've already seen your value because you're not treating them like a commodity. You're not treating the house like a commodity. You're not treating yourself like a commodity because realtors do that too. I know I'm a professional. I know what I bring to the table, but I need to deliver that in the space that she needs. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think as realtors, we always end up talking more and listening less, which is, you know, we need to flip that around like now. Um, and I, I think you're so you're so right. I mean, you want to have a game plan going into the appointment and then you need to execute on that game plan and listen to what your sellers actually want out of it. And well, I want to not force your game plan down their throat. Right. So yeah. you, you're, you're speaking exactly where realtors are. They mm -hmm. they kind of listen. But they're really thinking, how do I plug somebody into my plan instead of how do I create a plan for them? Because there's two different things. So do you remember the movie White Man Can't Jump Absolutely. with Woody Harrelson and Wesley Snipes? One of my favorites. So good. Do you remember that scene where they're in the convertible and Rosie Perez is in the back seat and Woody's trying to listen to Jimi Hendrix and Wesley mm -hmm. says, you can listen to Jimmy, but you can't hear Jimmy. And so I love that scene because I think it's the biggest way realtors can differentiate. Listening, you might be writing down the notes, but hearing, you're catching the inflection and the energy and the body language, and then you move. Listening, you might not move, but hearing, you do. And you know what's funny, Jason? I tell people to go watch that movie, and they're like, I'm like, it's a really good movie. It's a Quit great judging. movie. Yeah. They judge. <laughs> All right, so flipping the script from from sellers to buyers. Now, I, you know, this is just a, a actually a personal question because right now I have multiple buyers in a market that is just insanity, right? And we try and guide our buyers the best we can, and and some are better positioned than others in terms of what they can put down on a property, what they can offer on a property, right? But I have just this awesome set of buyers that I desperately, desperately want to get them a house, right? They just got engaged. They're a young couple. You just, you're rooting for them, right? But they can only put 5% down. Um, you know, conventional, which is good, probably better than, than going FHA at this point. But, um, you know, when you're lost in the shuffle of 15 other offers, right, how do you best coach your people to win out on a deal where maybe they can't compete with some of the other offers in terms of the down money, you know, maybe in terms of the other terms of the agreement they can. Um, but what's your best advice for buyers that are kind of in that category? Well, it's twofold. The first one is to stay away from these buyer love letters because too, too often they're a violation of federal fair housing because so many agents are putting a picture of the buyers in it and telling all their personal details, which means if they didn't win, we don't have any way of knowing if the seller and the seller's agent didn't have implicit or unconscious biases. And so first of all, just stay away from that. If you read about it on the internet, just remember the internet also thinks Abraham Lincoln invented the internet. So when you stay away from that, you're back to your offer, you went on terms. So the first thing a great agent does is call the listing agent and say, hey, Lee, I see your listing over here on Williams Road and my people want to win. What matters the most to your seller? Don't ask me the numbers. Don't ask me anything else. Say, what matters most? Because I can tell you most of the time with my sellers if they are focused on the best possible price, if they're concerned about the ability of the buyer to stay put, which is deposit terms, or is it closing date? Maybe that seller wants a 90-day close when, think about it, most of these cash offers come in, they're like, seven-day close, 10-day close, make it fast. Not everybody wants that. So ask great questions. And then a piece of advice that I got from a friend who, or she's a realtor in Wisconsin, it was brilliant. She said that the love letter she includes with the offer after she makes that phone call, she structures the offer as much as possible, guessing what the sellers want, because we know it's a blind bid. 
the letter she includes sells herself as the best buyer's agent. She says, I will be the best buyer's agent possible. I will communicate. I will be the one helping get bids. I'll help unlock doors. I will not hide anything from you. And I said, that's brilliant. And so we tried that because as realtors, those of us that are full-time professional realtors, we know each other in our marketplaces. Mm -hmm. I'm in a giant market and I know my best realtors because- yep. We love working together. And then when you get those other agents that email an offer and never called, never texted, it went to spam. Drives and then you have this one that yells at you because they didn't read the MLS. Those are not starting off the relationship in a way that's going to allow me to tell the seller what their best option is. So I loved her angle of telling that seller, we're a team over here that are committed to working forward. But with a, somebody with a lower down payment, you can still do a higher deposit. Now there's a risk, right? But for most buyers right now, they will gladly take that risk to take advantage of the interest rates and get their foot into the market because we know that the economic conditions aren't showing any signs of letting up with our supply and demand situation. So I, I'm all about communication and deposits. And the last house that I had with 25 offers, by the time my seller and I sorted through, we had four contenders. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. Too often... We tell ourselves that we can't win. So we kind of say, well, I mean, we'll see what happens. And we've given up before we started. And of those four offers, my sellers didn't even pick the highest one. They picked the one with the most security, which was the deposit offer because they needed to make plans. So you never know until you ask. Absolutely. Absolutely. What do you say to an agent out there that, you know, they're a good solid agent, maybe, you know, in our marketplace, maybe they're, you know, five to 10 million. They've been doing around the same kind of, you know, business for the past, I don't know, five years, and they want to get to that next level. What do you think differentiates someone from saying being a solid agent to being a superstar agent? What do you think they need to do to get to that next level? Well, I mean, the first question is, what is the next level to that agent? Because mm -hmm. one thing that drives me crazy in real estate is how we have an assumption that every 5 to $10 million agent wants to be a $100 million agent. A lot of them don't. They're like, oh, heck no, I don't want to have a big giant team, but I would love to have a little more time back. I would love to have a higher price point. I would love to only work with my private referrals. And so there's different success definitions out there is the first thing I would suggest there. But with most agents, when you want to achieve whatever the next level is, you have to have help. And I love y'all, whoever's listening and watching this, I love y'all, but you people are not organized. If I ask you what's in your bank account, you can ish tell me you don't balance checkbooks. Mm -hmm. You can do a percentage of any sales price, but I go asking you about revenue stamps and excise taxes and attorney fees, and you start to get all flummoxed because you don't do the numbers that well. But when you hire an administrative professional to help you with the DocuSign or the dot loop and the zip forms and share file and sky slope and whatever the tools are in the business where things can be plugged in for data privacy and security and to keep the brokerage updated. And that person can then take the closing and input it into your database, whether it's top producer or realty juggler or wise agent or whatever, to keep you organized. And that person can then print off five names and stick it in front of you and say, here, call these five people. That's what changes your business is when you focus on the revenue producing activities of real estate. And here's the trick, y'all. There are three revenue producing activities in real estate. Buyer consultations, listing presentations, and negotiations. Everything else can be delegated to somebody who's great at those affiliated tasks. Now, some of y'all are thinking, Lee Brown, you forgot closings. They're revenue generating. No, they're not. Closings are a direct result of buyer consultations, listing presentations, and successful negotiations. Somebody could go to your closing for you in theory. You could call Jason and say, hey, you're my manager. Go to my closing for me because I'm in the Bahamas. I'm trying to escape the COVID and the cold and I need to get away. <laughs> the closing can happen. But if you're in the Bahamas and an offer comes in on your listing and it was your best client referral, they, they could work with Jason, but they kind of need you and your expertise and skill to get them there. And once you understand that those three revenue producing activities are priority, mm -hmm. oh my gosh, your life changes. And so 
you have to sit down and define it, right? So if you want to work fewer hours, bring your manager into that discussion and say, here's what my goal is. Let me get some input because you don't have to do this by yourself. Mm -hmm. I think that's where agents do plateau and get stuck is they, they don't know where to go and they forget that they're surrounded by other amazing pros that would talk them through it, would share expertise, would mentor them. And that's not just within this particular company, but it's within the entire world of realtors in Pennsylvania and beyond. Mm -hmm. I mean, most of what I learned, I was given freely and graciously by realtors across the country who are just glad to share. Yeah. And I always fall into that trap for years and years and years. I was always a micromanager, right? I didn't want anybody touching any of my stuff. It didn't matter. Control freak. What, control freak. <laughs> exa control exactly. Freak. I'm total type A control freak, like your classic person that's like my head is going to explode by the time like I'm 50, right? So I, you know, I over time have learned that I need to delegate more. Like you said, focus on the, the the business that is going to make you money and and also the best use of your time as a realtor. Where's our value best laid, right? Well, so we know that old adage, if you're being, uh, what is it? If you're doing $15 an hour work, mm -hmm, yes. if you valued yourself at $15, yep. so you are your own assistant, Yep. But most realtors have this unique opportunity to make $500 an hour if you are honed in on your great activities. But if you're a control freak, I mean, you're not alone. That's why I can laugh at Jason because I've been in those shoes too. All of us that are top producers totally believe we're the only one that knows how to do things. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you delegate are the things that you feel honestly couldn't be screwed up. And that's turning in your paperwork to the office on time. Because managers kind of hate it when you turn in paperwork with the commission check at the end. We kind of like to have paperwork in advance, I'm just saying. But that person could help with the logistics. They could go drop off a deposit check. They could grab a sign and lockbox, things that don't impact your client contact. And once you realize they can do some tasks, you're going to feel free to give away more tasks. And then you'll discover the truth all along is if you ask any realtor with an assistant, when should you get one? Every single one of us would go back and say on the first day I got into real estate, when I couldn't afford it, I should have hired one. Yep. I hear that time and time and time again. And I'm a total knucklehead about it. You know, like I do have help, but I, I need to flat out just hire an assistant, bottom line. So anyway, all right. So I am friends with somebody that I, um, I my listeners know I'm a big fan of ninja selling. And, uh, Larry I'm, Kendall. and Larry Kendall, Larry was one of our guests on the podcast. I love Larry. And when I was out at the installation in Colorado with him, I met an agent from the Reading area and she's from a different brokerage, but she, we, we kind of hit it off. She's fantastic. So out of the blue, uh, it's Christmas time out of the blue, I get a package in the mail and it's from my friend, Brenda. Uh, that's, that's near Reading, which is about, you know, 45 minutes away from where I am. And so the book um, was called Secrets of Top Selling Agents. And all of a sudden, so, so you, I didn't know this at first. So I look inside the sleeve and I see that you are one of the, the uh, secrets. Contributors. Contributors. Contributor. Thank you. And you talk about in the book, uh, the power of scripting. And I have a, like a love hate relationship with scripting because to me, and I always told agents that I would mentor that scripting is fine, but it's got to be your voice or else it falls completely flat. And then in the book, you talk about that exact thing. And you talk about scripting, I think, in, in a great way. You talk about an athlete showing up to a game on game day and never practicing beforehand. So can you talk a little bit about the power of scripting and why that is so meaningful to agents? Well, I already said at the beginning of the podcast that the way I got to success was doing the hard things and doing the hard things first scripts and dialogues, that's a hard thing to do because you who are listening to this, you have all these internal excuses. I don't want to sound scripted. I don't want to sound canned. I don't want to be a used car salesman. I'm amazing. You're totally amazing. But what scripts give you is a safety net because we all get into these scenarios where you're like, and you need to know what to say. And so they give you what to say. But the way that you get really good at scripts and dialogues is practice. 
I mean, everything in life, you get better with practice. And of course, I do have a Southern accent and I know that it's my get out of jail free card. But still, if I'm not cognizant of how I say things and the energy that has to be in there, I too can sound scripted. The public doesn't know when you've practiced, but they sure as heck know when you don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. They can watch you start to look around because the eyes will give you away. They'll watch your uhs and ums and likes and so start to creep into the conversation because those are really, really easy words to lean on as a crutch. But they also mean you didn't know how to just pause and think. Scripts give you the chance to pause and think because if you know what to say automatically, your brain's working in the background. And so, for example, buyer calls me and says, hey, I'm in front of your house over here on Williams Road. And I keep using that one because it's my newest listing. Mm -hmm. I'm in front of this house on Williams Road. How much is it? Right. Every buyer asks that they have 14 apps on their phone. They know how much it is. They still say, how much is it? I say, oh, I'm so glad you called. May I ask you a few questions? What's my script? I'm so glad you called. May I ask you a few questions? I don't answer the price question, right? Because they already knew the price. They're using a script. That's the buyer script. How much is it? So my response, may I ask you a few questions, is designed to get me into professional mode as soon as possible. They're going to say, yes. Yeah, sure. Okay, great. And then I'm going to say, what's your name? Who else is involved in the decision? I'm going to go down my intake sheet, right? And that's what gives you the chance to elevate in your marketplace. That's what scripts can do. You're in a really, really competitive field. And by the time this podcast airs, there will be new realtors in the marketplace because the pre-licensing classes are full. Every time the economy feels wonky, people go get the license. They're like, well, I'll just do real estate just in case mm -hmm. until they find out exactly what's entailed in it. So in the meantime... You've got to be top of your game because you know what? Buyers and sellers need you. And the more easily you can get them into conversation, the more likely they are to lean on your guidance and competence and expertise so that you can help them make great decisions. If you don't know what to say, but your brains are good and your heart's good, they might not ever have a chance to find out. So I, I'll tell you, there's a new app called Clubhouse. Have you seen it, Jason? No, no, not oh yet. Oh my gosh. It's totally addictive, but it's a social network. You have to have an iPhone to get on it, but it's voice. So there's no video. There's no typing. There's no messaging. It's just people talking. And in that space, which has been active for like a month, realtors, of course, swarm in because we love new places to hang out. I've watched a lot of script and dialogue practice rooms crop mm -hmm. up. Agents across the country know that they get better when they practice. And frankly, that's what makes you great when you say, I want to be better and I'm willing to invest my time into it. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, everybody should download Clubhouse, I guess, right away because, um, yeah, I think when it comes to scripting, and you had mentioned this in the book that if you go out now, I, I guess I could call them Jasonisms, right? I, there's a lot of Jasonisms when I go out on a listing appointment. I find myself robotically saying stuff to answer questions time and time again. And I'm like, where did that come from? Like how, you know, how did I get to this point? But like you said, it's, it's practicing. So you have your own scripting. If you say you, you have answers to questions that you know are coming, right? You're, you're already scripting. So why not perfect that in terms of your listing presentation, your buyer consultation, all that good stuff. All right. So, um, you know, you have your hand in a lot of projects, right? You have a lot going on. I think you're like a runner, you're, you're a singer, you're all these different things and you have your hands in all these different buckets and pockets or whatever you want to say. Um, what makes you happy at this point in your life? You know, what do you really enjoy doing? Because you have the entrepreneurial side, you have, you know, you're a mother, you, you have all these different facets in your life. What do you truly enjoy doing? You have your own brokerage now. So do. what do you what do you enjoy doing? What makes you happy at this point? That makes me happy. And it's the easiest mom thing in the world. The kids make me happy. I love my teenagers. I don't know why people complain about them because I think they're amazing. I love their insights and their humor. And I just, I love that so much. But the other thing, of course, everybody knows that's a cop out because every mom should say that. <laughs> I had a, a experience last night where I was in a, a conversation in a mastermind group 
And I came into the conversation a minute late. And one of the leaders of the group said, okay, stop the conversation. Lee Brown's here. I'd never met this guy before in person. Mm -hmm. He said, you changed my life several years ago with this thing that you said. And he spouted something off. And he told me what he had done since then. And I was crying like a little girl, so proud and so happy and so flabbergasted because you're always planting seeds. And you never know when the harvest will happen. You don't know what the end game and the time frame look like. So what really brings me joy is just finding out that I did something right one day in my life, because I've done plenty wrong. I mean, I'm really good at putting my foot in my mouth, but that I did something right that impacted his life in a big way. And he says is now impacting his four kids and his wife and his family. I, I, I couldn't trade that for anything. And that also, besides making me feel great, it inspires me to go do more. It inspires me to continue volunteering and giving back and writing and helping create solutions because realtors are absolutely problem solvers. But that means that some among you are really good at bringing others along. You replace yourself with other great realtors and you bring people into a good space And so I'm replacing myself in the speaker world and the volunteer world. I'm always trying to bring more people in so that they too can experience what I experienced last night of finding out that one time years ago, you impacted somebody. Golly, that was, it was amazing. So of course I asked him for his address because he's fixing to get a little Lee Brown prize in the mail. (laughs) Because I love sending out a Cersei. Well, I got to say, I mean, you've been incredibly gracious with your time with me and I know um, that you're a very, very busy person. And I truly appreciate you coming on the podcast today. It's always my pleasure. And if you want a copy of these intake sheets that I use to give to your agents, then give me a shout and I'll be glad to provide that and you'll make your life easy. I would love to do that. Oh, and one last thing. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, where can people find you online and uh, you know about your podcast as well? Well, my my first podcast is Crazy Fit in Real Estate, and that's four and a half years of my personal passion project to showcase how professional realtors manage in unknown and unexpected scenarios. Most of the episodes are about 15 minutes long, and you'll giggle, and you'll cry, and you'll say, what? And that's the whole point of the show. So if you listen to that and you have a story to tell, I'm always taking guests, and I love that my guests are primarily normal realtors and nobody swanky fancy. Although I did have the first post-presidential interview with Bill Brown from NAR after his double lung transplant. And Bill and I talked for an hour and I just, he's one of my dearest mentors. And my new podcast is called Real Estate from the Rooftops where I'm trying to break down the bigger real estate issues in a way that makes sense. So my latest episode is about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and realtors need to understand the implications. But it's, it's kind of difficult if you're not a wonky person. So I try to bring some Lee Brown isms to it so that you can explain it to clients. And so those are my two podcasts, but you can find me online. I'm probably the most easy realtor to find online. I'm Lee Brown, Lee Thomas Brown on Facebook with my maiden name, but go find me and ask me questions. You see my videos, you see my marketing, you're welcome to take anything and put your version on it and roll with it. Because honestly, so much of what we do is, transferable from market to market and realtor to realtor, the key is figuring out your unique capabilities in real estate and then dialing that in so that your neighbors know exactly why they should call you and not anybody else. Fantastic. Well, Lee, thanks again. I, again, it's a pleasure and uh, we'll be talking to you soon. Thank you. Thanks for having me on the show. And I'll send you those intake forms for any astute listener who asks for it. He's not going to send it company wide. Y'all got to ask. <laughs> thanks, Lee. That was the interview with Lee Brown, and I thank her for her time. And as you can see, Lee has a lot to say. She is just a ball of fire when it comes to real estate and life in general. Uh, she was really, really fun to talk to. We had to actually kind of edit some some parts out just for timing purposes, but uh, she certainly had a lot to say, and she has very valuable information. Obviously, Lee is a very successful real estate agent, and she has years of experience, and I I think that what she conveys as far as what we talked about during the podcast is critically important to your business. Number one, 
Um, you know, treat your business like a business, right? It took a lot for Lee to become the number one agent in her marketplace. It took a lot of hours and she had to decide what she wanted moving forward. And she kind of pared back a little bit to, to have some more time off and to spend that time with her family. So, you know, it's not just about the, the hours that you put in. It's not just about being the number one agent. It's about what you want out of real estate. What do you want uh, you know, when it comes to your income, when it comes to your time. Number two, practice, practice, practice. Lee talks about practicing with scripts. She also talks about, you know, practicing on listing appointments, listening to your clients. Always find out what your clients want. Don't dictate to them what they want. Let them tell you what they want and then move on from there as a strategy. And number three, um, I, I think it's just important to be out there and and help your fellow agent, agents. That's something that Lee really takes pride in and actually gets her happiness from is teaching other agents and helping other agents. She's heavily involved in boards and she's heavily involved in NAR um, and, and she really pays it forward in, as far as her time goes and her, her breadth of knowledge when it comes to real estate. So get involved and get out there and help your fellow realtor. That's it for this week's episode. I'm glad that you joined us and we'll be back in another couple of weeks with a brand new episode, brand new guests. And uh, if you want to hear anything in particular, remember, you can always reach out to me, jason.ostrowski at foxroach.com. But until then, we'll see you in a few weeks. Stay safe out there, stay selling, and we'll catch you next time on the Everything Real Estate Podcast.